Bank Holiday Monday, the Queen's Golden Jubilee. 50-year-old retired engineer Neville Powell is out for a drive with his partner, Gloria. Normally when we go out, I'll say to Gloria, which way are we going, north or south? And she went, let's go to Rye. We drove down to Brighton and made our way along the coast through Eastbourne and we eventually ended up in Rye. Everyone was in a good mood. It was just a really peaceful day. We had a little bite of fish and chips. I got the map out, we had a quick look. I said, we'll make our way back through the countryside rather than through the coast. We left Rye, I suppose, early afternoon. Fairly twisty road, opening up into long straights and then short twists. I call it a driver's road. Not too busy. We're poodling along 40, 45, and it was just a lovely day. I can't say anything other than that. Eight miles away, 50-year-old Peggy Langdown is enjoying the Jubilee festivities with her family. Newington was having a Jubilee party on their village green. They've got a very nice village green there. We would just go into Potter around and spend a bit of money on the stalls, doing what you do at a village fete. Peter had just finished his first year at university, so he'd come home for the summer break. So it was lovely to see him because this was the first time he had been away from home for any length of time. Peter's cousin, Adam, was the brother that Peter had never had. He had been 17 at the time. Peter said that he was going to take Adam over to Hawkehurst to get petrol for the car. Um, and I think, yeah, he probably wanted to show Adam his new car. So we said, yes, sure, see you in half an hour. No reason to think that anything at all was going to happen and that what happened was going to be so completely and utterly devastating. The motorcycle came out of nowhere very fast. I had no knowledge of his approaching from behind. My actual feeling was, why do you need to go so fast? There was no point. Enjoy the day, or, or if you want to go fast on a motorbike, take it to a track. He went past me so fast, I had to physically pull in, and I said he'll be on his backside round the bend. That whole thing did unsettle me, and it may have been a precursor to what happened next. Peter was a typical teenager. He was going out into the world. He was this great adventure. He was going to go to university. He's always been a very outgoing, very friendly boy. He's got a smile that would break a million hearts. He was just full of life. He was very proud of his, his nice new, new to him car. It wasn't a new, new car. It's a five, 10 minute drive to Hawkehurst. You don't expect anything untoward to happen. He was 19 years old. Why would you think anything untoward was going to happen? The last possible thing that we would ever have imagined is what actually did happen to him. Fifty-year-old retired engineer Neville and his partner Gloria are on their way home after a drive along the south coast. You couldn't have wished for a nicer day, pottering along about 100 miles away from home. We came around a bend in the road which opened up onto a fairly short straight. Suddenly, from being a beautiful, languid, placid day, life had changed. There in the middle of the road was a car engine. and a piece of suspension, a wheel and a suspension leg. It, what had happened? It was so quiet. No other traffic on the road on what, would, what had basically been a busy day. Nothing. So, where is everybody? What's happening? Why is it like this? Then I saw a car on the near side of the road, but almost at a right angle to the road. It was kind of unreal.
I do believe that in your life you come to a junction every day. You don't know whether you're going to go left or right. You don't know what's going to happen next. I just knew that I couldn't walk away from it. Sometimes it's automatic. It, it's a chemical reaction. You get on and do it. I said to Gloria, stay in the car. And she said, be careful. She's always saying, be careful, since I had my stroke. I started running towards the car, but I doubled back to get my phone because instantly it was a much bigger situation than I thought it might have been. I do remember speaking to an operator and she said, uh, oh, our ambulances are at an incident in Ashford. There's a procession or something. I said, well, this isn't an incident. This is serious. As I approached, the first thing you notice is that the engine has physically been torn out of the car, thrown out of the car, like a stone when you're throwing it into the sea. I fully expected when I got there to find that the occupants of the car would have been out of it or dead. But there was two lads sitting in the car talking to each other as if nothing had happened. It all took a little while to sink in. You think, this can't be right. Why haven't they got out of the car? And then the driver said, what's this? Then I noticed that there were some marks on the road and in the ditch to the left that indicated that the car had traveled into the ditch, probably backwards. And there was a post and rail fence at the bottom of the ditch. One of the rails had snapped off with the impact of the vehicle and found its way through the rear window, which it must have smashed, and gone through the rear of the driver's seat and had come physically through the driver's back and out through his chest in that sort of area. He was absolutely impaled in the seat. If it had been a film set, you'd have thought, this is a little bit macabre, but this was real life. The passenger didn't appear to be physically damaged. The driver, however, was in serious trouble. When I'd worked offshore previously, you, you go through medical courses and emergency courses and fire drills, and the first thing they teach you is leave the people where they are. Let the professional services deal with it. That wasn't an option. There was absolutely no alternative but to get him out of the car because it was going to catch fire. <coughs> the car had started to burn. The wiring loom had set fire to some of the plastic trim. The fuel pipe is in the vicinity. We didn't know how much time we had, or I didn't know how much time we could have taken. But certainly, it was a petrol car. I know my cars, and they don't burn for very long before they explode with petrol on them. I tried to get the driver's door open, but couldn't. It was jammed shut. I couldn't, in my heart of hearts, think about leaving the lads to burn in the car, which was what would have happened. Um, <sighs> 33-year-old insurance manager Tim Slater is the second man to arrive at the scene. That day, I was at a barbecue, probably 200 yards from the main road. I didn't actually hear it, but... Um, there were some people there who had a big bang, a loud bang. I just thought, well, I'll see what's going on. When I got to where the car was in the ditch, I initially f froze. I was a little bit scared and thinking, what can I do here? Um, we've got a car on fire, something I'd never seen before. But I could see someone outside of the car, so I felt that, you know, at least I could, could help. I ran around the front of the car to the passenger side. Suddenly, another gentleman appeared at the passenger door. I didn't know who he was. 
but I think our eyes met and we suddenly realised that we'd have to work as a team to get the passenger out. The passenger door was jammed, but it was stuck ajar, so I just thought, the fact that I play football and using my, my feet, my legs, I'll, I'll kick the door open. They were shouting, get us out of here, get us out of here. Ran around the car as quickly as I can to assist him in getting the passenger out. He was just guided gently away. It was like he just woke up from a dream, really, not knowing what had gone on. Then we had the problem of getting the driver out. I just had to get the driver's door open. I remember sort of putting my body against it and really heaving on the door. Fortunately, it came open. never seen such sort of carnage instantly. The electrical wiring loom had melted and had caused a short circuit and had caused an electrical fire, which was burning the dash, the plastic, all the fibre board hidden up under behind the dash. I know from experience, the fuel delivery pipe, which is about eight or 10 million diameter, is there somewhere. And most modern cars have a plastic fuel pipe instead of a metal pipe. And when that starts burning, it's a ticking time bomb because the fuel obviously will ignite in the tank. It's like a fuse. When it's on fire, how long's the fuse? And when it goes, end of game, end of story. I was intensely aware that things were going from bad to worse all the time. The driver was absolutely impaled by this wooden stake. He was nailed to the seat. There was the only option was to try and tear the seat apart. The other chap, whose name I now know is Tim, he appeared at the passenger door again, and I said, I'm gonna try and pull the seat apart because we won't get this stake out. We'll kill him. It was at that moment when there were flames in the footwell of the driver's side just had to do something immediately, so I got in the passenger seat. I had to get my torso over Peter's right-hand shoulder, and my head was just behind his head, and I'm trying to physically pull this seat apart with Tim holding the piece of wood so that it didn't waggle and move. I was conscious that if I twisted it, that it could cause serious damage, so I was thinking, wow, this is serious. I can't do anything here to cause any further damage. The thought of holding a post coming out of someone's shoulder makes me feel a little bit sick, actually, even, even saying it now. I'd had a stroke a couple of years previously, so I was intensely aware that your heart rate goes up, your pulse goes up, the adrenaline goes up. This is not the right place to be. You don't want to be there, but what else can you do? The situation was weirdly calm, actually. It was quite serene. We were like in a different world. It's like you're on autopilot. You take every opportunity until the last one. I would have carried on and carried on until the last, until the last. Struggling to get the seat torn apart, we were aware that the whole vehicle could just explode at any moment. It was a bomb waiting to go off. <laughs> then we had the problem of how to get this four foot piece of wood past the door pillar and out through the passenger door with Peter attached to it, I, I really didn't think we were gonna get him out alive. Tim managed to maneuver the post as I'm trying to twist Peter round. We asked the driver to, to shuffle across 
over to the passenger seat. I held the fence post in my arms. I was very careful to hold it a level. We got him into the passenger seat and he was now in a position with his legs on the driver's seat. I rushed round to the passenger side again. Tim physically took the stake and we literally frog marched him away. At that moment, the car blew up um, and just into total flames. The flames were just going very high. Boom, like that. And um, it's black smoke, acrid, instantly. I remember Gloria shouting, are you all right, you all right? I said, yes, I'm all right, we're all right. And then it went quiet. I think then it dawned on me that I could have been in that car. I think that was the first time I thought, wow, that was what I've been involved in. <laughs> that's quite, that's quite heavy, that is. I must admit, I took probably the second breath that I'd taken that day. It was just a deep sigh of relief. But the, the job wasn't over. A lady appeared with a blanket from somewhere, from a house, and we covered him over. By this stage, there were a fair few spectators. Ambulances had turned up, and the police were there as well. <sighs> That's good. Someone else. Someone to take control of it but then within a few minutes Peter's phone rang it's been an hour since Peggy's son Peter left the fate in his car we were standing around with Jeremy Fiona chatting Anna our daughter Peter's sister turned up with her then boyfriend Paul. She was in a sort of agitated state because she and Paul had been held up in traffic um, as they had to drive past what was evidently a very, very serious road accident. It was the sort of scene where they were convinced that nobody would get out alive. The car was in such a state. I don't know why, I just knew that it was Peter's car. So I grabbed my mobile and dialed Peter's number. When you make a phone call and you expect somebody you love more than anything else in the whole wide world to answer the phone and somebody else answers it and they tell you your son's been in a bit of an accident, your world changes. In that instant, your world is never going to be the same again. I have two halves to my life. I have the life before Peter's accident and the life after Peter's accident. They are completely different, completely separate lives and there the twain shall meet. At this point, the fire brigade managed to cut this post off him and were getting him into the ambulance. And that was the last I saw of Peter for a long time. Yeah. I just mingled back with the crowd, actually, the people I was with. I'd felt that it's like doing a job. I just didn't feel anything, to be honest. <laughs> As we got out of the car, your mind's in a million and one places. You know, is your son going to be alive when you get there? Is Adam going to be all right? There was a police officer around the accident scene. All we can see is what was the remains, the shell. It didn't resemble anything that the car had been when Peter and Adam had left New Indon. We explained that it was our children in that car. He told us they haven't been burnt, 
and that they were taken to the Conquest Hospital. You're just praying and praying that they're going to be all right. For a few moments, I stood there, I was slightly bewildered. Had this happened? I couldn't do any more, so I went and sat in the car. Gloria kept asking me questions, and I, I probably wasn't really hearing them. Difficult world to come out of. You think, wow, this is a different world. You know, I've stepped out of my, my safe cycle, my safe enclosure. I mean, I'm somewhere totally different now. thing that's really crazy is that your life can change at any given moment. It's not like the movies where there's some dramatic build up to um, an event where your life changes. Um, it just happens when you least suspect it. Had I done anything different during that day, it would have changed my entire life forever. We went around a corner and I can remember seeing a motorbike in front of us. It was a wide open straight bit of road, so I thought I could just quite easily drive around the bike and carry on going. As I went around the bike, I obviously went too wide and hit the curb on the other side of the road. From what I've been told, that's, that's where it went wrong. I couldn't really emphasize enough how utterly surreal it is to go from being in this really happy, relaxing, moment to this state of you know waking up terrified and pain and not knowing what's going on although they tried their best to keep my arm um, what actually happened is I got something that's called compartment syndrome so the only thing they could do um, was was amputate above just above my elbow as regards how the accident happens I don't think anybody will ever really know it's possible he clipped the curbstone and lost control of the car, but I don't think that's frightfully important. The boys are alive. That's the thing to hang on to. I do often look back on my life. If I'm having a good moment, I think back to Neville and I think, wow, thanks, Neville. Everything, everything I've ever had is from that day onwards it's because of you. The fact that I did it for a total stranger doesn't matter. I'd have done it for anyone in a similar situation. I took in my mind, hopefully, what was a calculated risk. Uh, fortunately, it worked out. If it hadn't, well, I wouldn't be here to tell this story. They didn't just save Peter and Adam's life. They saved all of our lives. Because if our boys had died in that fire, I don't know where we'd be today but we wouldn't be where we are. We'd be living a completely different life. They saved everybody that day. I feel proud of the fact that I was involved in saving someone's life, and it gives me a sense of happiness, really, that they're still living today um, and that I was involved in it. Mm -hmm.